one of the successes was that the visibility on all the work that was getting done was very, very easy and trackable. Hi, this is Tricia Ratliff. Welcome to my innovation podcast. I'm here this morning with Keith, who works with federal clients who have recently been experimenting with lean portfolio management. And when he told me some of his story, I thought it would be great to share on the podcast his real boots on the ground experiments that the teams that he's worked with have been trying. Hi, Keith. How are you doing? Good morning. Good morning. It's good to have you here. So um, so where would you like to begin? Well, I think just the concepts of agile and lean, right? When we talk about government, right? Those kind of sometimes maybe even seem diametrically opposed. <laughs> um, but traditionally, a lot of agencies used waterfall methodologies. And you would get long running projects, year and a half, two years, and they never seem to, to end. Um, so basically from there, the idea was to implement concepts where we were doing more iterative uh, stuff. So maybe in a step from waterfall to agile, you know, just getting an iterative cadence was most important. Uh, the other part of it was with the lean portfolio management side is the uh, initiation of projects and being able to uh, prioritize and determine resource uh, dependencies and impacts uh, before we started the different initiatives. So the idea was to try to not go into a long requirements gathering process for 13 weeks and then waste all that money and then decide, oh, we're not gonna move forward with this project. So we had sort of an incremental step where we used a, a hypothesis uh, statement for the project. And if the concept seemed uh, appropriate, then, then we would go through an approval process in a facilitated LP, like a weekly lean portfolio discussion. Let's move that forward and then develop a lean business case. And then we would do the lean business case and it still wouldn't be close to the 13 week type stuff. It would be, a, you know, a couple weeks ma maximum. And we would come up with, uh, you know, an estimate of what the level of effort was, where the integration points, what resources needed to be there, what other dependencies might be in place. And if it was decided that it was worth on taking, then it would get approved and it would go into a backlog. Uh, but it would sit in the backlog until resources were available. So we weren't really formal on WIP limits and, and some of the you know, more technical concepts of lean portfolio management, but we were, we were following a Kanban type process where we you know, progressed from one step to the next. And then once it got into the backlog, got approved, when it was ready and resources were available, we'd start the project and then report on it through normal reporting mechanisms. And not every project that was approved through the lean portfolio management process was an agile project, although most were, and that was certainly the target. You know, it, once the project got initiated, it could kind of run its own way. And then when it was complete, it would come back into uh, the portfolio management and, and be a closed project. So, you know, it's a much higher level um, governance process that was over the top of all the initiatives. But you know, in the beginning, it was a lot of new terminology and what have you. So we had to uh, train, educate, um, you know, just expose people to the concepts. And over a period of the first six to nine months, uh, it became fairly rote. And people would talk around, hey, my LPM 53, my LPM 22, you know, uh, where is the status or, or what are we doing with that? Right. So people just got used to that point. And then we'd have a lot of different stakeholders in those meetings when we decided on prioritization, if it was appropriate. They weren't always like standing members, but they would come in to represent their project, understand what you know people were saying. And so there was more collaborative and collective agreement mm. on what was a priority for the agency. And 
so that helped out tremendously of probably one of the one of the successes, one of the successes was, that the, was that the visibility on all the work on all the work that was getting done was very was very easy very and easy and trackable and then you know again some of the other constraints like within the federal government rate that you get funded and there's a clin structure and so we created instead of doing like a burn down chart you know technically the way uh agile would want you to do it we used sort of to take the estimates from the lean business cases and we would decrement from the clin structure to kind of do a budgeting type process to know what the remaining funding would be for the year so that facilitated the ability sort of to adapt and pivot and also improve the time to value so everybody knew we were working on the most priority uh, work and that helped it uh, you know kind of move along and it, it, I think customer satisfaction was much greater as a result of that as well so you know it the lean portfolio management was a you know a, an alignment with agile and lean processes and that was where we kind of took it and and sort of evolved and over a you know year and a half to two years it was just a smooth running uh process and uh i think if you went to any of the uh, agency stakeholders they would would agree wow i have so many questions for you and i'll bet our listeners do too i'll put some of them out there and you can uh answer whatever you like first First, I'll bet they're curious about logistics, about how big the queue might have been of projects or efforts, initiatives, products, or funded units that were coming in. So maybe give a sense of the size of the queue, the length of some of these efforts, and how many people maybe were involved. So let's just work with some numbers first. And then once we have some of those stats underway, I have more questions for you about things like what the business case looked like and how you did your your estimates. So begin wherever you think it's relevant for those who are trying to get their head around the the size of the queue, the amount of lean portfolio management that you're doing and the folks involved. We had an agency that was looking to move completely to the cloud and, and get rid of their data centers. Uh, so we had to figure out a way to, you know, to create a roadmap at the highest level um, and then, you know, kind of break it down into chunks. And those were, you know, the hypotheses that I was talking about. Like we would break those down mm -hmm. kind of like, uh, you know, just your normal, um, way to frame up, you know, a, uh, a story, um, or an epic. And that was like the beginning. And so we kind of then noodled that around. But as an overall sort of kind of scope size to give you, we're probably 40, 40 to 50 projects per year okay. that we use through the process. Um, what I'm hearing, so though, that, that, I'll interrupt for a moment, because what I'm hearing, though, you're emphasizing that from the very first days, you you moved away from a purely project mindset and really got the conversation moving around experiments. Did I hear that right? Yes. So the concepts of uh, the experimentation, which is part of that was a little bit where when we got into, say, a lean business case, but we could not really uh, define certain things. That's where we would do like sort of a blending of mm -hmm. uh, the typical government AOA process analysis of alternatives. Um, and that was really where we would kind of if you will, equate to the experimentation, but that wasn't done on all all projects. That was done when when necessary. Ah, oh, gotcha. Okay, uh, sorry, I interrupted. You were telling me more about the stats. Go for it. So yeah, so 40, 50 projects a year. Uh, you know that was that was the way it was going, and we tried to keep each project to uh, less than four months. Uh, so that we had, you know, and we focused on outcomes. So that was how we kind of governed it, right? Was to make sure that we were achieving the desired outcomes. And that's, if we had to pivot or adapt, it was because we either weren't able to achieve the right outcomes or we had to modify what the outcome really needed to be. Uh, but, but, but again, versus a one and a half or a two year running project, uh, 
you know, the opportunities to do that were usually only at phase gates, you know, end of design, end of uh, development, end of test. And this allowed that cycle to be, you know, much quicker. So the other concept along with outcomes, you know, is the minimum viable product. Really trying to focus on what can be achieved and put into production and really re reduce that time to value is really what, you know, started to drive and become more commonplace. And people didn't always think that way in waterfall mentality. And that was a little bit of a change. Uh, the other thing I think, you know, in, in general with agile projects in the federal space is trying to get a dedicated pro product owner that could come in and stand with the cadence, you know, with all the agile ceremonies, the stand-ups, the retrospectives, the demos, and be fully engaged on an ongoing basis versus here, I gave you my requirements, give me a product. Um, and so there's a little bit of a need to kind of educate uh, the, the, the federal counterparts on what their role needs to be and what, what's expected. And so, you know, that went back into some of the early training and education processes that I was talking about a little bit earlier, which is we, we did a, an Agile 101 and a Lean 101 presentation where literally hundreds of people uh, were able to attend that and then get the vocabulary, understand the concepts so that when we were doing it, it wasn't really foreign to them. And then over time, by going through the process, and we even used uh, on a couple select projects, uh, Dojo, uh, to really kind of help accelerate, uh, you know, the uh, and build the maturity of the agile um, processes. So it sounds like your product owners were government employees. Am I hearing you correctly? That's correct. If you were to, if they were here now and you could take a guess about what motivated them to take on those roles, what maybe had they been nervous about? What did they like about the role? Is there anything that comes to mind for you? The, uh, the biggest thing I think is collaboration and versus, you know, command and authority. Uh, you know, if you work together as a cohesive team where mm -hmm. everybody's bought into the outcome, then it becomes engaging and everybody sort of commits to that process. So you, you could teach somebody what a product owner is and you can teach them about all the ceremonies, but you really need to sort of find somebody that has the capacity to, to collaborate and to engage and work, you know, in a team structure. And I could, I could go to some examples of where we had the vendor, another agency that was uh, involved, like, uh, you know, as a governance kind of a thing, the agency people, and then the project team, and we would have these joint sessions and with everybody working towards the same end goal, it just broke down a lot of that sort of bureaucratic, um, that's not my scope, um, that's not my responsibility, that's somebody else's and then wait for them to resolve it. We just, we all resolved it. We all worked towards fixing the problems and we had the stand up and, and demo type uh, ceremonies to be able to do that on a frequent, very, you know, weekly basis. So there was constant feedback and, uh, and learning. So Keith, when this was first getting set up, what did it take to really get the buy-in to get it started? How did you get sort of some mind share around, okay, we're ready to do this and give it a try. Were there any tension points? So in one particular case, let's say we had a two-year goal to get out of the data centers. And that was fairly immovable date-wise. Mm -hmm. So knowing that we had two years, we couldn't, you know, drum up a bunch of one, one and a half, two-year projects. It just wasn't going to work. So there was a realization between the management on both the agency side and on our program that we needed to do things 
in a much more agile and adaptive kind of way. Uh, so to your original question, like, yes, executive leadership was the first step. We brought in a safe expert to talk to their leadership and describe what, you know, what it would take to put in an LPM process and what it would take to improve, you know, your agile based projects. And so once they understood sort of what, what they needed to do and what needed to be done, then we were able to kind of move forward. And that's when we started to create some of the education programs. We put some pilots in place. We tried, you know, we had to work through the Kanban. How are we going to facilitate that? How are we going to do the financing? What were going to be the um, different ceremonies or, uh, you know, meetings, uh, review meetings that needed to be in place and how that would be blended into sort of the legacy way of doing things. So that, you know, we, we, we tried not to be completely uh, revolutionary. We tried to leverage what was good and working in existing processes and blend them in with sort of more classic uh, agile practices. And, and, and I think we found a nice uh, medium between those two things. Uh, so we definitely got the uh, management buy-in. Then we started the mass education uh, type efforts, and we started some pilot uh, processes to fine tune how we we're going to do the hypothesis. And I think you asked me to question too about the lean business case. So the hypothesis was basically a maybe three slide PowerPoint with specific uh, things in there, like uh, like a story or an epic description, and then what resources, that kind of stuff, just broad stuff. And then in the lean business case, which basically took those original four to five slides, got up to about 10 to 13 slides with the detail, with some cost estimates, some breakdowns of uh, the project, high level project structure and things like that. So it added some of that complexity back in. And again, if, if that wasn't enough, then we could potentially go to the AOAs and the experimentation if needed. But I would say 80% of the projects um, or initiatives um, basically uh, went through with just a hypothesis in a lean business case. You know, it's when you're buying a new product, bringing something completely new into the environment that those needed to be vetted in a little bit more detail. And that's where the AOA, AOA and experimentation took place. In this situation, could anyone bring forward a lean business case? Yes. So the ideation phase or whatever you want to call that initial piece, um, it could be generated from anybody. But the, the, the good thing about it was it was one central place to do it. And that was what allowed then the uh, governance to, to look at it from prioritization, uh, business impact, uh, return on investment, you know, a much more broader set of things. Whereas in the old days, so to speak, when the agency didn't have such a two year kind of mandate to get something done, um, you know, projects would be generated in a security group, in an app group, in an infrastructure team, and sometimes went underneath the radar. Uh, but since all funding had to be dedicated to achieving the, uh, the goal, it, it forced, forced it to be more centralized and highly scrutinized. Gotcha. Okay. So when you talk about the lean business case and you mentioned three slides, which sounds great, by the way, because it sounds very simple with an epic. So I'm assuming that an epic identifies basically who it's for, what the outcome would be, why it's needed, like a story format. Am, am I making a accurate assumption there? It's Exactly. Use the stand, the classic story format. Yeah. Okay. Would that happen in a kind of pitch format? Can you talk a little bit about what that looked like? So there was a standard form, you know, mm -hmm. a, a PowerPoint template. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there were some guidance and then you could always, you know, send somebody an example of one that, you know, they could use as a as a, as a 
guidepost. And from there, just, you know, create it. If, okay. if it came in, it got presented and it was lacking in some areas, maybe they had to, you know, go back and rework it a little bit, come back next week. Um, but, but, you know, typically the people that were doing them over time, be got, you know, became familiar with the process and how to do that. And so there was less rework being done. There was something that I was kind of getting at there. I was really pleased to hear you say just now is that that psychological safety that, Hey, I can put this forward. And if it doesn't fly the first week, I can just come back and improve it the next time. So am I hearing that right? That there was a sense of you just keep pitching it until it either looks like it's never going to be approved or uh, you've improved it enough that it's ready for approval. Yeah. So we, we had a, uh, an LPM experienced resource that was facilitating the whole process. Gotcha. And so they were the, they were the, the brokerage or the, you know, for, for all that stuff. So if they need, if somebody needed help, um, with developing the hypothesis, we'd even have, you know, one-off meetings with, you know, just enough people to kind of help guide them through that initial draft mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, kind of work it from there. So, you know, that's, that's where, you know, just building it. And then over time, you know, less and less of that was needed. Wonderful. Okay, great. So but, but there was always, there's always the business view of the solution and the technical um, demands of the situ solution that have to be reconciled. So some of some of that mostly came into the the lean business case, but you know once you sort of have the hypothesis, then you know some some um, architects you know and uh, SMEs have to be involved to to basically noodle around what what does that solution actually look like technically um, to, to make that happen. And so, you know, that that was kind of in from the original hypothesis more into the lean business case. And then again, if if necessary, maybe doing an, an analysis of alternatives and, and some experimentation. Keith, can you give us uh, and our listeners a sense of how much effort went into that initial estimation with the folks who would be delivering on the hypothesis or the effort? Yeah. So the hypothesis, if it was a first hit, it was like a one week thing, uh, maybe two weeks if they need to clean some stuff up, then, then it would come in. And if it was approved to go to the lean business case, lean business cases took anything from one week to three weeks, but it wasn't long. Um, it was the idea of getting it you know, close understanding what the key key dependencies and technic technical resources needed to be. You know, it's things like when it uncovers, like if you didn't have enough server capacity or storage capacity or software licenses, you know, things could technically get derailed a little bit, you know, waiting for uh, how that would be accomplished from a procurement standpoint. But when, when all the resources, if you will, were in house, uh, typically, that was, you know, maybe a couple week process as, as an average. Gotcha. Okay. You mentioned estimates, and I was curious what the estimates might look like. Yeah. So, so in the lean business case, there would be one slide dedicated to which, which resource groups needed to support it. So, and then there was an estimate of the hours, um, high level estimates of the hours of the various, uh, you know, resources. Um, so that was one piece of it. It's a simple rows and columns, tape table, you know, different phases, things like that, months, mm. you know, um, and then a summation, okay. you know, in certain resources, like, for example, right, you know, you need an architect in the beginning, and then you need them a little bit in the ongoing capacity. Um, then the actual administrator things might ramp up during the implementation, the developers, whatever it may be. So, you know, we just kind of sort of create a, an outline of what that would look like, you know, and then kind of use that as the, uh, the basis of estimate. We wouldn't do it necessarily as a name basis. We would do it more as a role 
uh, uh, the, the estimation techniques that we use, I would say are mostly predominantly analogy based, right? So if it's, if we've, if we'd migrated something before we had that experience factor to kind of use that as a, a an example. And so, you know, we could do the small, medium, large kind of sizing types of things um, and estimate it, you know, and that's when, when it got to be the larger ones, right. We try to figure out how, how we could break that down into multiple, multiple phases where we keep the project within that three to four month um, window, you know, sort of disassemble the project and break it down into uh, chunks and, and work it from there. So how important was it for that to be accurate? If they found out later they were wrong, how was that handled? Well, that's kind of sort of inherent to the process, right? So you were committed to that three, four, like if say, if, sometimes they were shorter, but if it was uh, a three, four month project, you know, that that funding, if you will, was sort of committed. So what did it take to get to, you know, the three to four months? That's when you could decide whether or not things are going in the right direction and the adapt or pivot uh, concept came in, okay. which is in a larger waterfall project that doesn't, you usually don't get those many chances to adapt or pivot. So in a way, the process itself kind of mitigated some of that risk. Thank you for clarifying that. So let's talk about the dedicated teams versus teams working on multiple things at a time, because both seem to be common in in organizations that I've worked with over the last 20 years. Do you have any thoughts or opinions on that? Yes. So the, you know, everybody would love to have dedica dedicated resources on every project, but there are different roles that are on the project, right? So I would say that of most agile teams, right, the a number of people that were dedicated would be a smaller number but they were dedicated. And then the SME type work uh, and everything else that required, like say you needed the server build, right? You wouldn't have that person on full time, but during a certain phase of the project, they would need to be building uh, the servers. So, you know, they didn't necessarily have to be there all the time. And so that was another way to kind of govern how, how frequent the standups and how frequent the demos and, and retrospectives needed to be, because then the full team, you know, the broader team would be involved in those sessions. But rather than burning a lot of hours and time on stuff that, you know, just it's sitting in meetings, if you will, um, you know, we tried to find the balance between the frequency of the ceremonies and the need for uh, the constant involvement. Thank you, Keith. I, I can assure you a lot of the information you've just shared is going to be incredibly valuable to other people. Is there anything that you're sort of wishing I would ask that um, that you want to bring out about this? Um, the only thing that I would say, and I go back to collaboration, I think the Agile process works better um, and with collaboration. And, and the idea is the frequency of, 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 of getting people's inputs so that you can continually uh, refine things. You know, it's don't go off in a corner, come back and, and find out that's not what I want, right? So frequency and iterative process inherent in all those different things, the just the incremental approach to the project initiation through the hypothesis and the lean business case you know, saves time and effort on things that aren't valuable. You eliminate a lot of waste through the process. And I think that, that you can feel much better at the end that you did everything you could because some projects you just don't know. I mean, you can't envision every problem that you're going to face. But if you have a process that can adapt to it and do that more frequently, I think you're you're better off and everybody can agree with what, what the decisions were, when they were made, and why it, why it happened the way it did. Um, but there's not that big lack of uh, euphoria at the end of the project that that's not what I want. So, Keith, what might you say to 
an organization where they would argue that, well, our leaders are busy and they don't have time to to come to these sessions. Any thoughts on that? It's, it's a cultural shift, uh, you know, not going to deny it. So the change management, right, the education programs, the awareness sessions, the high level, you know, executive buy-in uh, so that they're they're champions for the whole process. It, you, you need that. And, you know, fortunately, in the efforts that I've had, that people were able to make the adjustment and things improved. But I, I suppose there are situations where, you know, the culture may may fight it. Right. A lot of people want to pull you back into the rut. Uh, this is the way we always did it. And so there has to be some kind of. You know, and fortunately, hopefully not a mandate. Right. But there's got to be some kind of a vision, a shared vision um, that people can can latch on to. And I think that that starting with executive leadership down through the ranks is is what's needed so that people buy in. Yeah. You mentioned and once you get really the buy in, it, it, it accelerates. Great. OK, thank you. I think that's an important point worth repeating. So thank you for sharing that. And speaking of repeating, would you say that the experience that you've had is repeatable in other federal organizations? I do. I, I think that there's a lot of people trying or thinking they're trying to go to agile and lean practices. But, you know, with security, with uh, governance, with with various, you know, legacy processes, um, just OMB reporting, um, things like that, make it challenging to to feel like you can actually accomplish it. But I think if you really understand the concepts in a, an abstract way, you can start to apply them with the legacy processes and say, well, this isn't something we have to fix right away, but this is something we have to change. Like So the fact of getting everything into one intake and then having a Kanban progression with visibility, transparency into that whole process, that goes a long way so that somebody doesn't feel like they're getting gypped on their project, um, you know, and or fa somebody else is being in favor. Um, and so it's a trust, you know, kind of a thing that has to be built. Um, but once once people are consistent and working the process in and there's the appropriate uh, oversight, then, you know, it, it, it tends to kind of work itself out. Wow, that's great. Uh, Keith, thanks for sharing all this good news. Um, if there's anything else you'd like to talk about, now's a good time before we wrap up. Is there any other topic you'd like to bring up? No, I, I think other than, you know, uh, the training, the individuals, right, as far as really understanding, you know, agile concepts and lean practices. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there are other things, you know, like design thinking and, and all those other things that that are involved out there. You know, a lot of this comes too from a like a DevOps, right, is another area that they complement each other, right? DevOps is an iterative process and, and it drives towards automation, right? So, being able to get the efficiencies in the processes is 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 key and sometimes you know like the legacy documentation processes tend to you know get uh you know not as strict governance as they they form the formality of a design deliverable you can still have those but you know, if you go to the Agile Manifesto, right, it, it, we favor this versus that. There's some things you have to give up a little bit on and be willing to compromise a little bit for the overall benefit of, uh, you know, benefit of what Agile can bring you. Wow, that's a really important point. Referring back to that right. in order to make a balanced decision about just how much documentation do we really need because the customer collaboration is more valuable. Is that what you're getting at? Yes. Okay. What 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 gives you more value? And and it, it it's not you you say well you know if, in a process it's like a check a checklist right mm -hmm. check 
check, check, check. And it's not always a hard check. You know, it, it could be, um, we got it 80%, 80-20, 90-10, you know, close enough. And that's what minimum viable product really kind of correlates to a little bit too. It doesn't have every bell, whistle, and feature, but sometimes those features, call, like one feature may be 30% of the cost. And if you can compromise that, you know, you could save money and you can make it less complex and you can implement it sooner. So it, it's really trying to understand that time to value, minimum viable product, iterative, you know, you can always improve it, continuous improvement versus the big bang monolithic project. Great. Wow. Wonderful. Well, Keith, thank you for coming together and uh, sharing your time and your knowledge. I'd be curious to hear more. I know based on our discussion prior to the podcast that you are, of course, repeating this with other federal organizations. So I'd be curious in the future to hear how those are going and uh, hear you share again, if you're open to that. Certainly. Thanks, Thanks for having me. You're welcome.